The student's t-test, or simply the t-test, is a type of parametric statistical test used to determine if there's a significant difference between the means, or averages, of two groups. And significance is normally defined by a p-value of less than 0.05, or 5%. Now, when doing any parametric test, there are three key assumptions that we have to make about the population. Firstly, the sample population must have been recruited randomly. Choosing names randomly ensures that the people included in the study will have similar characteristics to the target population. This is really important because it ensures that the results of the t-test can be applied to the target population, meaning it has good external validity. The second assumption is that each individual in the sample was recruited independently from other individuals in the sample. In other words, no individuals influenced whether or not any other individual was included in the study. For example, if two friends decided to get their blood pressures measured on the same day, and they were both included in the study, these two individuals would not be independent of each other, and the second assumption would not be met. Like random sampling, independent recruitment of individuals is important because it ensures that the sample population approximates the target population. The third assumption is that the sample size is large enough to approximate the target population, which usually means having more than 20 people. If it's impossible to get a large sample size, then the sample population must follow a normal bell-shaped distribution for the characteristic being studied, because that's what we'd expect to see in the target population. OK, now let's say you want to figure out if a certain medication lowers systolic blood pressure. So you measure 25 people's systolic blood pressure and find that the mean systolic blood pressure for the whole group is 138 millimetres of mercury. Then you give them the medication, and after six weeks you find that the mean systolic blood pressure for the group is only 130 millimetres of mercury. Now, to figure out if a decrease in systolic blood pressure from 138 to 130 is significant, we could perform a t-test. Specifically, since the two means were measured in the same population before and after the treatment, we could use a paired t-test. This is different than an unpaired t-test, or a two-sample t-test, which is used to compare two groups of individuals. For example, an unpaired t-test could compare the systolic blood pressure measurements of a group of 25 people who used the medication for six weeks to a group of 25 people who did not use the medication for six weeks. Typically, a paired t-test starts with two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the null hypothesis, and it basically says that the mean of the differences between the groups is equal to zero. In other words, the null hypothesis is that taking the medication results in no difference in systolic blood pressure. The second hypothesis is the alternate hypothesis, and since a t-test can be either one-sided or two-sided, there are two versions of the alternative hypothesis. The alternate hypothesis for a one-sided t-test would either state that the mean of the differences is a positive number, or that the mean of the differences is a negative number. The alternate hypothesis for a two-sided t-test would state that the mean of the differences for both groups is not equal to zero, but it wouldn't specify if it was a positive or negative number. Typically, researchers choose to use two-sided t-tests, since they usually don't know how the medication will affect people who take it. So, the two-sided alternative hypothesis for our study would state that the mean of the differences in systolic blood pressure for people that take the medication compared to people that don't take the medication is not equal to zero. To test these hypotheses, we need to calculate a t-score, which is a ratio of the mean of the differences between the two groups to the standard error of the mean of the differences between the two groups. Let's start with the first part, the mean of the differences between the two groups. In our case, that's the difference in systolic blood pressure in individuals before and after the treatment, and it's represented by the symbol D-bar. For example, let's calculate the mean of the differences for the first three people in the study. Let's say that their systolic blood pressures before the medication were 135, 142 and 137 millimetres of mercury, and after the medication they were 127, 145 and 128 millimetres of mercury. For each individual, we can find the difference by subtracting the value taken before the medication from the value taken after the medication. So for person 1, it's 127 minus 135, or minus 8. For person 2, it's 145 minus 142, or plus 3. And for person 3, it's 128 minus 137, or minus 9. Now, to find the mean of the differences, we add up all the individual differences and divide by the number of people in the group. If we were just using the first three people, it would be minus 8 plus plus 3 plus minus 9, divided by 3, so minus 4.7. That's just for three people, 
So to save time, let's assume that for all 25 people in the study, the mean of the differences was minus 10. That would mean that on average, systolic blood pressure decreases by 10 millimeters of mercury after using the medication. Now onto the second part, the standard error of the mean of the differences between the two groups, or simply the standard error. Put differently, we need to find out on average how far the sample population mean of differences, which we just calculated, is from the true population mean of differences, which is usually the mean of the differences for the general population. To do that, we have to find the standard deviation and divide that number by the square root of the sample size. In this situation, the standard deviation measures how far each individual difference in blood pressure, before and after the medication, is from the overall mean of the differences. A large standard deviation means that the numbers are very spread out from the mean, like if the mean of the differences was minus 10, and the individual differences included numbers like 5, minus 31, and 15. A small standard deviation means that the numbers are very close to the mean, like if the mean of the differences was minus 10, and the individual differences included numbers like minus 7, minus 11, and minus 5. So let's say that the standard deviation for the differences is 8. This means that on average, the individual differences in blood pressure were 8 millimeters of mercury away from the mean of the differences. Now, to calculate the standard error, we divide the standard deviation, 8, by the square root of the sample size, which is the square root of 25, or 5, and that equals 1.6. Now, a smaller standard error like this one shows that the sample mean is more representative of true population mean, and that's good, because then we can apply the results of the study to the general population. To find the t-score, we divide the mean of the differences between the two groups, minus 10, by the standard error, 1.6, which equals minus 4.96. To figure out if this is a significant t-score, we have to compare the t-score to the critical value for the study, which is a predetermined number used to determine whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. If the absolute value of the t-score is greater than the critical value, then the null hypothesis is false, and we can conclude that there's a significant relationship between medication and blood pressure. Critical values can be found on a t-score table like this one, which has degrees of freedom on the side and the significance level on the top. The degrees of freedom of a study are calculated by subtracting the number of groups in the study from the sample size. So, in this situation, we have one group of 25 people. So the degrees of freedom is 25 minus 1, or 24. The significance level is the p-value that's determined by the researchers at the beginning of the study, and usually it's just 0.05, or 5%. Using 24 degrees of freedom and a significance level of 0.05, we find a critical value of 2.064. The absolute value of our t-score is 4.96, which is above the critical value of 2.064, so we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a relationship between medication and blood pressure. T-tests are most often calculated using statistical software, and the software will often provide a p-value. This p-value is the probability of obtaining a given t-score or a higher t-score if the null hypothesis is true. In short, the p-value cuts out the step of finding the critical value. So if we use a significance level of 0.05, then a test with a p-value of less than 0.05 will indicate that the null hypothesis is false, and that there is a significant relationship between medication and blood pressure. Finally, it's important to keep in mind that if the assumptions of an unpaired t-test are not met, we can't be sure that the results of the t-test can be applied to the target population, so a t-test shouldn't be used. Instead, we could use a non-parametric test called the Wilcoxon signed rank test, which doesn't rely on parametric assumptions. In short, the Wilcoxon signed rank test compares the differences in medians of the two groups to determine if the two variables are related. So, in this case, if medication affects blood pressure, Parametric tests are generally favoured over non-parametric tests, so the results of the Wilcoxon signed rank tests are not considered as strong of evidence for a relationship between the two variables compared to the t-test. Alright, so as a quick recap, paired t-tests are a type of parametric test used to compare one group of individuals at two different times. Each t-test has a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis, and to test these hypotheses, we can calculate a t-score by dividing the mean of the differences between the groups by the standard error of the mean of the differences. This equation calculates a t-score, which can be compared to a critical value to determine if two variables are significantly related or not. 
There are three assumptions, random sampling, independent recruitment, and large sample size or normal distribution, that must be met in order to complete a t-test. And if these assumptions are not met, the Wilcoxon signed rank test can be used to determine if there's a relationship between the two variables. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.